Folks, I have uh, five o'clock, so why don't we get going, and, and thank you. I'm going to hold questions till the end. I've got uh, 63 slides in under 60 minutes, plus two demos. And uh, at one point, I had 66, and I posted on Twitter, is that okay? People are like, no, abort. I'm like, no, not aborting. So um, it's going to be fast. I give talks the way I like receiving talks, which is fast and furious. Uh, a copy of this talk is online. If you go to ericconrad.com, I just uploaded it about a couple hours ago. So all the slides, go to ericconrad.com, all the EBTX files, the, the GitHub site, all the references, everything else, everything's there. So if I move a bit too fast for you to keep up in real time, you can download the talk from my website, relive all those golden moments, and be happy, all right? So uh, welcome to my talk. As I said there, it's all online. All the code for PowerShell, for Python, the EBTX files, Deep Blue, Deep Blue uh, uh, PowerShell, Deep Blue Python, Deep White, which I'm announcing today for the first time. All that stuff and more is on my, well, link from my website, go to GitHub, etc. So a little about me, uh, I had a big year this year, then that happened, you know. Uh, Oregon Trail expert, you know. Um, my parents could not be more proud, you know, mainly because I cured them of snake bite. But anyways, um, so um, it ain't bragging if it's true. All right, so. All right, so if you're here last year, I debuted uh, Deep Blue last year here, and uh, a bunch of stuff has happened since. So if you saw last year's talk, this talk is going to be maybe 20% review, 80% new. So if you're here last year, like Erica said that, I didn't want to make last year's prereq a uh, prereq for this year. You know, I didn't want you to have to go watch that first to keep up. So I'm going to intersp intersperse some stuff from last year. The stuff I covered last year is going to be faster than the stuff that's brand new this year, because again, I got a lot to talk about plus uh, some demos, et cetera. So like I said, I give talks the way I like receiving them, and uh, screw those six fish in particular right there, as God said. All right, so um, one of my favorite quotes, I find myself quoting this over and over again, is sunlight is the best disinfectant. Louis Brandeis said that at Brandeis University fame. He was talking about the government, but um, it applies here too. You know, uh, malice festers in the, dar in the darkness. And the way we shed light to that is we get sunlight on it. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. We need to know what we don't know, you know. Um, you know, Donald Rumsfeld once talked about known knowns and known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And I think about that quote a lot, too, because he was right. It just blew people's mind. They couldn't quite parse it. And they laughed at him because they didn't understand him. They mocked him because they didn't understand him. And what he was saying was, there's things we know we know. There's things we don't, we, we know we don't know. And there's things we don't know that we don't know. And we need to figure that stuff. The last is the worst. So when all the noobs out there laughed at him, I'm like, I get it. It hurts my brain, but I get it. We have to know what we don't know. And if you're not logging command lines, you're not running Sysmon, you're not running a security event 4688, you're not doing PowerShell script block logging, there's a lot of things you don't know that you don't know, right? Sunlight is the best disinfectant. We have to shed light on that. Also, detective controls allow, allow us to be much more aggressive. Obviously, preventive controls only go so far. Preventive controls, by their nature, have to be conservative to the, the risk of a false positive. However, the detective controls, as long as they're not overwhelming, we can stomach some false positives. So I can tell you, block all service names that are 16 characters, alpha only. I can't tell you to block that. There's a risk of, of collateral damage, right? However, I can say, let's log it. Let's log that and look at it. And maybe four out of five are bad, and one out of five is good. OK. I'm going to take that hit on the, uh, in, in my SOC, in my SIM. I'm not taking that hit as a preventive control, but as a detective control, you bet. Absolutely. So we need to be more aggressive in detection. As we all know, prevention is ideal and detection is a must. And if you want to flip that around and be more, a bit more direct, as I tend to be, prevention will always inevitably fail in the face of a persistent adversary. And in the end, all we have is detection. Well, not all we have, but detection is where it steps in. We, if, if prevention is going to fail, in the face of a persistent adversary, we must detect. And of course, we've got the, um, the um, evolution of Windows malware payloads. You know, a lot of my clients are defending like it's uh, 2008, 2010. What did the old malware do? It dropped a big fat EXE in the file system somewhere, in a temp folder, in the Windows System 32 directory, and I try to run that thing. And your corporate antivirus, your corporate endpoint protection suites, the semantics, and all that kind of stuff, they get this goal line defense designed to stop exactly that. And they do a pretty good job of it. And that's what we did in 2008. And the malware in 2008 was largely mitigated by that. And now the world has changed. And the attackers are vastly out um, evolving the defenders. The red team is racing leaps, quantum leaps ahead in the, um, the advent of, of quote, fileless malware. 
And PowerShell is just taken off like wildfire. Lee Holmes talked today. You know, saying that, you know, malware uses PowerShell on Windows is like saying malware uses Bash on Linux. Yeah, I get it. It didn't get in through PowerShell, but it's there. They're living off the land. And there's nothing, PowerShell's fantastic. There's this old school Unix guy, you have to get to, you know, bow down and you just bow to the, the amazing awesomeness of PowerShell. If you saw Lee earlier today at 2 o'clock, you saw that. And yeah, the malware is using it because it's awesome. And they're not getting in through PowerShell. PowerShell is post-exploitation, but they're lighting up all over the PowerShell. Uh, by default, there's no logging in PowerShell. PowerShell 2 has virtually none, which describes Windows 7. PowerShell 4 and 5 have more if you turn it on, right? Most don't. And sunlight is the best disinfectant. So here's an example of fileless malware here. This is Metasploit has moved a lot of its payloads over to the fileless version. A couple of years ago, uh, the, the, the native payload, the native upload, drop that big fat exe, run it, your antivirus would squash, squash it, your endpoint protection suite would, uh, suite would squash it, you feel good about yourself. And now Metasploit, like all the uh, post-exploitation frameworks, they're moving on to this fileless version. And what you see there is this amazing big long PowerShell command. And I know it's an eye chart, and I know it's a lot to put on a slide, but I did it on purpose to kind of impress you with the enormity of what's going on in one command line. And if we look at it, it's 2,400 bytes long. PowerShell launched by CMD, a very, very typical vector for malware. Not a typical way that your PowerShell normally launches at work, but uh, for malware, very, very common for CMD or some normal process to launch PowerShell separately. It's a hidden PowerShell window, gzip compressed and base64. Why are they gzip compressing and base64ing? Well, the gzip makes the whole thing smaller. They can fit it more in the command line. And base64 does add a very simple layer of obfuscation, which helps further hide from your, um, your other endpoint protection suites, your antivirus, et cetera. And here's an even bigger eye chart. That's what lays beneath, right? And I can't tell you how many times over the years I would manually gzip-d this stuff. I would manually um, dbase64 it and then look at it. And as the old Unix system and saying goes, if you um, uh, typed it twice, you should have scripted it once. And after typing this more than twice, I can tell you that. I said, okay, let's, let's script this once, right? Let's script this once. And I took my own advice. And um, there are a lot of advantages to this method, of course. And this is why the malware is all over it. Um, again, CMD launching PowerShell, nothing saved to the disk. There's nothing to squash on the disk. This is fileless malware, right? And so there's nothing for your antivirus. You know, your antivirus product is generally watching the file system, seeing files, dropping them, and scanning them. There's nothing there, right? There's nothing there. Uh, set execution policy has 0.0% .0 effect, and as Ben 10 said, uh, set execution policy is not a security control. If you're afraid, set execution policy controls the running of PS1 scripts. If you save a PS1 script to the file system and try to run it, set execution policy steps in and tries to perhaps stop that. None of the malware I've ever seen worked that way. It works mostly one of two ways. The shove everything under the command line and once, or do net web uh, download string, which is kind of like a wget for PowerShell, right? The equivalent of wget for PowerShell. In neither case does it touch the file system. So if you never touch the file system, uh, this doesn't affect, this has no effect. You can still load PS1 files while dodging this, by the way. The net web download client can also download a file colon whack whack URL, which this doesn't affect at all. So th that has basically no effect. By default, there's no logging. And again, sunlight is the best disinfected. And the malware is festering in that darkness. The uh, pen testers are all over, dancing through this darkness. And when I ran some of the new frameworks, like, like PowerShell Empire and PowerSploit and PS Attack on a Windows 7, just the typical system my clients have, there was nothing, like zero logs. I'm going through the application log. I'm going through the security event log. I'm going through the uh, system log with a fine-tooth comb. I literally would clear the events, run PS Attack, check, and there's nothing, nothing there. And if there's nothing there, well, what chance does your SIM, your SOC have? Your SIM and your SOC are buried in thousands, perhaps millions of events. And even if they were in there, that's hard enough, but they're not even in there, right? That makes it that much harder. So Deep Blue CLI v2, the update since last year, if you were here. Of course, my talk last year, if you're going to get caught up afterwards, if you weren't here last year, uh, Iron Geek, uh, Adrian Crenshaw, thank you, Adrian, recorded it. It's on YouTube. Watch it. And um, updates since then, um, we've had a lot of stuff. Deep blue, uh, deep white, which is detective whitelisting via sysmon logs. Um, detects everything I talked about and a whole lot more. Processes local event logs or EBTX files. And it now outputs in objects. That was one of my um, takeaways from last year. And I said that last year. Last year, it outputted it in text. I'm like, man, if I did it in objects, I could do like out grid view, format table, convert to HTML, convert to CSV, 
All the goodness. Why didn't I write in objects last year? Because I'm a Eunice guy and objects hurt my mind. You know, they hurt my brain, right? Now, if you want to learn PowerShell objects, and if I finally learned them better, I'm not saying well, I'm saying better, write a custom object. It just clicked in my mind then. Like until I wrote a custom object, I didn't quite get it. Like I mostly got it broad strokes, but once I wrote a custom object, which is way easier than you think, look at the code. It's, it's not complex code. Download it from GitHub. It's a couple of lines. I'm like, oh, duh, that was pretty easy. Different, awesome, and, but, but fairly easy, right? And uh, thanks to Mick, Mick sitting back there for his help with the, uh, the JSON and the objectification of uh, Deep Blue CLI. Check out Mick's talk and uh, Sunday, 10 a.m. tomorrow. And uh, I talked about last year the perfect solution fallacy, and I fight this constantly with my clients, and I came up with this quote I like a lot from Voltaire. I wonder who originally said the perfect is the enemy of good, and it was Voltaire, or at least popularized it hundreds of years ago. We see this constantly in the industry. You come up with a great idea, and my very you know, humble and uh, well-biased opinion, I think this is a pretty good idea. I think it works. I had someone last year who was here at DerbyCon grab uh, event logs from a three-week event that they handled for their client. They ran deep blue CLI across it like Eric. I figured out like 75% of it in minutes. It took us days. Like, cool, cool, right? And um, you look at deep blue CLI and go, okay, looking for Mimi cats, I'll make it Mimi dogs. Ha ha, you suck, you know? It's like, well, listen, um, perfect is the enemy of good, you know? None of our solutions are perfect. Firewalls aren't perfect. Antivirus isn't perfect. Whatever next generation, Fidelis or Tanium or FireEye, that's not perfect either. If we truly believed in the perfect solution fallacy, which is a solution is not useful unless it's perfect, we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't patch because that fails. We wouldn't have antivirus because that fails. So just because you can come up with your, in your mind a use case where this might fail, um, sure, it might fail. But perfect is the enemy of good. And I was pretty pleased when Daniel Bohannon dropped Invoke uh, Obfuscation last year, and that was my favorite talk from last year. Um, you know, and, and I didn't have access to the tool yet because he, he dropped the tool later. And when I finally got my hands on the tool, I, I ran Deep Blue CLI against it. It did really well. Like having really never seen anything beyond one screenshot on Twitter, it handled it pretty well. And then I tweaked it to do it better. And that's the description of our careers. It's always attack, counterattack. It's always measure, countermeasure. The attackers have gone out of fileless malware, and now we're adapting. That, that defines our career. That's why I love this career. Who wants to spend their years, their, their lives doing boring things? I don't want to do boring, mundane things. I want to do exciting, you know, interesting, compelling things that are important. And yeah, there's, there's no doubt Daniel Bohannon could probably sit here and think of 15 ways to get past this. I, I don't doubt that for a second. And that's awesome. And that's awesome, right? So um, uh, I was pleased as the new stuff rolled in. For example, um, you know, Petty is moving via WMI now. Petty is moving via PS Exec. And I got some samples of that stuff, and I ran Deep Blue CLI, and I caught it. And I tweaked it. So there's always a measure, countermeasure thing, but I'm pretty pleased where we're at. There's a lot more we can do here, but I think we're in a good place. And some people spend their whole career shooting good ideas down because they're merely different. And let me tell you, friends, status quo is not working. If you're a defender of status quo, I don't have to tell you with Equifax and OPM and Anthem. So OPM is all my clearance data, Equifax is all my financial data, and Anthem is all my healthcare data. There's nothing left to steal. There's nothing left to steal, which I guess I should be relieved by. It's finally over. You know, I can, <laughs> I can stop worrying now, you know. <laughs> Thank God that's over. I can, you know. So, um, but um, status quo ain't working. It's not working. And if you find yourself, and these people sit on change management boards and they populate and they slow down change. They talk about prudence and being careful and testing. Even when I'm talking about detective controls, like even like app locker and detect mode only, people fight that because they don't know what app locker is, and they never did that before, and it's different, so they fight it instinctively, right? So you need to be persistent. Think about Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper spent a lot of her career as a speaker talking about that exact issue, people fighting change. And we can thank her for the compiler, the compiler and many other things, because she thought differently than that, thankfully, right? So uh, here's a list of new stuff from last year or improved stuff. Deep Blue CLI did PowerShell last year. It does a lot more now. It's better at that. I'll talk about what form of PowerShell it does. It doesn't do the actual script block stuff. It does a command that launches that script block. That's so much easier. And uh, there's another talk tomorrow by Lee and Daniel um, Bohannon I'll talk about as well that takes on that more difficult issue of the script block stuff. Um, regex matching PowerShell command lines, Base64. Compressed Base64 encoded. A lot more obfuscation. Well, actually, the obfuscation detection went from one line to a couple. It's still pretty simple stuff, and I, I, I like the, the KISS principle, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So the obfuscation code is more, but it's simple, and it catches most of it. Um, also, the, uh, the, the Pedia, not Pedia, eternal Pedia vector of spreading via WMI and, uh, and or PSExec and or exploits, we'll talk about that. 
And um, an idea we had for a long time, what we call a belt and suspenders detective whitelisting process, where you suck out all the uh, hashes from Sysmon, check them against the whitelist, and then auto submit to VirusTotal for free. I had this idea in my, my head for years. I had a slide in Security 5.11 saying, hey, if you want to do this, right, do that. Just do all that. Write a script to pull out the Sysmon, uh, grab the SHA-256, and finally trying to bring a little more sexy to this talk. I wrote that about, I don't know, a week ago. So now you get that one too. We'll talk about all of that. Uh, we get regex, a little review from last year. You can drop in your own regexes. You don't need to know any coding whatsoever. You don't have to know any PowerShell. If there's a regex that's firing that, that is a uh, false positive, you can either tweak it or comment it out. I just try to keep this stuff as simple as possible. Everything's free as in beer free. Bring it back to work on Monday. Get this stuff going. Um, are long command lines automatically malicious? No, no, they're not. Plenty of things. Google famously creates these giant, giant long command lines. And they're doing it for the same reason other things are doing it. They're trying to avoid touching the file system just to avoid all the complexity of whatever endpoint control, even though it's benign software, whatever endpoint control happens to be there. And um, so we do have normal commands running these giant um, command lines. And that's okay, too. Normally, a long command line over 1,000 bytes, gets, over 500 bytes gets flagged. Or I think it's 1,000 bytes, but you can change that. It's just a variable. Uh, in this case, it supports a whitelist as well. If Deep Blue CLI sees base64 and or encoded data, It'll attempt to, it's not perfect, it'll attempt to debase 64 and de-encode it. And um, I've been pretty pleased as I throw new frameworks at Deep Blue CLI, because there's all kinds of ways to dodge the base 64. In fact, Daniel Bohannon's uh, invoke obfuscation has some modes that Deep Blue CLI doesn't currently handle automatically, mainly because I haven't had time to look at it. But the vast majority of malware I find, um, actually, a bit, a Deep Blue CLI automatically catches it and debase 64s it. So it scans the command. It'll run the, uh, the um, signature checks against that command. If it notices it's base64, it'll attempt to be, uh, decode the base64 and then rescan that content that lies beneath that automatically as well. And uh, I mean, pretty, it's not perfect. You could dodge that, but most stuff it's currently catching. And it comes into not only the perfect solution fallacy, but the perfect attacker fallacy, which is this, as I talked about last year, this cartoon supervillain who somehow psychically anticipated all your um, preventive and detective controls and has automatically evaded them in advance. And this person doesn't exist. You know, I, I know, you know, people talk about nation state attacks, how stealthy they are. Um, I'll tell you, the NSA hacking tools, that stuff was crazy stealthy. When I saw Eternal Blue against uh, SMB, I'm like, and I'm looking at the PCAP, and, and I have the shell, and I'm like, where is the C2? Where, I'm looking at the PCAP. Where is the command? And it's via SMB as well. I'm like, whoa. So some of this stuff is stealthy. But one of the things I've realized about malware auth is, is for every genius who wrote the NSA hacking tools or the alleged NSA hacking tools that leaked, that, that team, that person, stone cold, stone cold genius, no doubt. But for every genius, there's a thousand copycats out there. You know, and that, that's just the truth. For every true genius who can do stuff like that and basically alter reality in the form of packets, for every person who can do that, there's a thousand who just copy the, 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 the last most successful thing that happened, right? So the idea that all the, um, all the malware, all the C2 is uber, uber stealthy, 99.999% of it anyways. 99.9% .9 is not. The NSA hacking tools, sure, but now we're, we're adjusting to that as well. And that's, again, that's the nature of our careers. That's why we've all chosen great careers. We certainly are never bored, or not for long, you know, and I like that. I like that, right? So as I mentioned, um, if you're looking at the, one of the things I realized, and I had a few moments of like, you know, oh my, oh, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. I'm just going to fail. Like I have these grand visions of like, hey, I'll not, I won't just do security event log 4688, which is command line parsing, and or sysmon event one. I'll get the same thing from PowerShell. How hard could it possibly be? You know, famous last words. And all of a sudden, deep blue CLI is blowing up on these multi-thousand byte chunks of script block stuff, and it's just exploding and just spewing all over my screen. I'm like, I totally suck at this. I'm going to fail in front of everyone. I'm going to... And then I'm like, calm down, calm down, calm down. Look at it, look at it, look at it. And I found a way uh, to peel out the command line that launches a script lock. Now, if you want to take on the script lock stuff, uh, Lee Holmes and uh, Daniel Bohannon tomorrow, I'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock, uh, Revoke Obfuscation looks at that, running statistical analysis of the actual script locks themselves, looking for signs of obfuscation in there. That's a much harder thing to do. Much harder. If you look at the command line, just the command line, not the actual script itself, but the command line that launched it, that's easier. Easier, I won't say easy. If you want to actually parse a script lock, that gets tougher. And I'm very excited for that talk tomorrow. And I love that Daniel Bohannon, he, you know, he could just come in and do shock and awe campaign and be all red team about this and leave and feel good about himself. And I'd still think that was cool. But the fact that he does blue as well, I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. It's a great example to lead by that. 
you know, breaking stuff is easy, fixing stuff is hard. We all know that, right? So awesome for Daniel. I'll be in the room tomorrow. That's, that's the talk I'm most looking forward to, and Lee as well. So, um, and I kind of got lost a bit in the wild there. You know when you do a Google search and you find five responses, you know, uh, three of which is some list of numbers that don't actually match? Yeah, you, that lost in the wilderness feeling, you know. I felt that a bit, and I had a few moments of panic when I, I pitched the DerbyCon idea. And you, you have that moment when you get the CFP, yes, you get in, like, yes, yes, crap, crap. What did I do to myself? Why did I? My wife's like, why exactly are you doing this? Because <laughs> it's awesome. Once it's over, <laughs> leading up to it, not so much <laughs> sometimes. And um, so I, I kind of got lost in the wilderness a bit. And I can thank Daniel Bohannon, uh, Hacker Hurricane, and Heinz Arelli. Um, uh, I met um, at least two of those folks. And um, just blog posts. Oh, FireEye has an awesome um, blog, which I forgot to mention here, on hunting malice through PowerShell logging. Just Google FireEye PowerShell logging, and you'll see it. Um, these little uh, these little oases in the desert as I wander around lost, because I'm not natively the, the strongest Windows guy. You know, I started as a Unix admin. I've never been a Windows administrator in my life. I'm learning as much as I can about Windows now. But I had that, that moment of, like, I have no idea what I'm doing here, <laughs> getting lost in the registry and lost in event logs. And I found a few uh, guides to help me through the desert there. I just want to say thank you to them. And so here we have, um, we're, de we're detecting invoke obfuscation here. This is one of the, the countless ways uh, you can uh, obfuscate uh, PowerShell commands. And um, in this case, we're, we're simply um, counting the percentage of normal characters in a, in a command line, meaning uppercase, lowercase, numbers, slashes, colons, things like that. And just get a percentage. What percentage of A's through Z and 0 through 9 and, and slash and whatnot is in the, in the command? If it's below a certain threshold, which you control, by the way, it's just a global variable you can set, flag it. Flag it and say, hey, if it's a very short command, you get a handicap because uh, a 10-byte command is more likely to be 50% characters. Oh, boy. The Iceman cometh. All right, well, I was ready for this, so hold on, hold on. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it on Twitter later. All right, so um, it's funny. I was having dinner with Trent last night, and he says, so what time's your talk? And I'm like, Friday at 5. I'm like, why am I helping him? Why did I tell him that? I got some weird con version of Stockholm Syndrome where I like and admire my tormentor, you know? And um, you may also, if you are here last year, I chugged this, and if you've seen me since last year, I've lost a third of my body weight and three quarters of my stomach. So, um, um, both intentionally, by the way. That, that sounded drastic, but. <laughs> so, I'm going to drink. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, if you're here last year, um, my, my, that, that was during my chugging days. So, I will drink this politely, but if I chug this right now, I'll just um, lay down and roll around and groan for a while. So, uh, I will drink this. And uh, I just want to give a quick shout out, a little more personal note. If you're suffering from what I am suffering and did suffer for, from being heavy, uh, 120 pounds heavier. I, I, one of the things that pushed the, the ball across the line for me of deciding to do something more permanent was I talked to a farmer from Perth, Australia, flying the 13-hour flight from L.A. down to Sydney. And hearing him talk about it made it more personal for me. It made it more like an option for me where I just kind of rejected it as weakness. So anyways, I'll be at LobbyCon afterwards. And if, if you want to talk to me about this, uh, this struggle, many of us struggle with, I'm happy to do it. So I'll politely drink this, but uh, I can't chug it. And I mean that. Come talk to me. All right. I was inspired, by the way, by, by Lee, by your Ice Ice Baby. So I, I decided to go a different way. So <laughs> Lee did Ice Ice Baby. I did that. I'll put that on Twitter later. So, all right. And thank, and thank you for that. It's, it's, it, was, it was time. All right. Yeah, in, in my mind, my wife asked me, are they going to ice you again? I said, no, it's, it's like a baptism. They do it once. It's an indoctrination. Because they do it once, and that's all they do. And I believe this to be true because it seemed true to me. And it fit in my worldview, and I liked the idea. And so I believed it, and well, you know, anyways. This describes our current world problem, by the way, worldview of, I believed it because it was true. All right, so uh, <laughs> here we are. All right, so Pedia. Pedia is the, you know, people like me have been talking for years, just wait till the malware gets smart. Just wait. Because malware didn't normally move like pen testers move. Malware was like exploit, 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 exploit. That's that's most worms. That's not how pen testers move. A good pen test is one exploit, a thousand boxes go down. 
Right? A good pen test is own a box, steal the credentials, run Mimi Cats, grab the hashes, grab the usernames, grab the passwords, grab the tokens, move laterally. Most malware would never move like that. It would just fire off exploit, fire off exploit, fire off exploit. We all predicted, hey, someday, malware's going to get smart. It's going to start auto-pivoting like humans do. Well, Petty is the first, eternal Petty, uh, not Petty, is the first thing to do that. So you have uh, a thousand boxes. Two are missing, missing MS-17010. The rest are not. Three years ago, that similar exploit, like MS-08067, two boxes would have gone down, that's it. Would have owned those two, would have fired up the exploit at the other 998, it would have failed because they were passion, that was it. Now, Petty is like, no, no, no. Those two go down, we steal credentials, we move laterally. All thousand go down, perhaps, depending on your trust levels and everything else and how much segmentation you have. And we put, hey, someday the malware is going to get smart. And here we are. And uh, again, the vast majority of malware authors are copycats. They don't just copy code, they copy techniques. So this is coming in a big way. Now that this is a proven case record where um, you know companies are losing hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, they're going to have copycats now. So here's a test command I used uh, for just, if I fired off something in some direction, whether it's via WMI or PS exec or invoke obfuscation or whatever, I use this because it's very typical of what pen testers do. In the old days, we dropped a fat Mimikatz exe on the, on the file system and, and try to run it. Now we do this. Fileless Mimikatz, right? Fileless Mimikatz, and um, it never tests the file system. Your, um, your controls about execution policy have no effect on this. And so this is my test case. So here's PowerShell via PS exec. And uh, by the way, every time I say pro tip or fun fact, it means I drove my car into a ditch and it caught on fire. And then uh, I figured it out later, okay? So that's a little, little hint to you. If I say pro tip or fun fact, that means I crashed my car and then later on figured out what I did wrong. I'm like, why isn't it working? Do what I mean. Do what I, I'm, that, yeah, the account is admin. I'm like, oh, das H, turn off UAC. All right, so um, help files are good. Here's the event log view, and it's actually pretty easy to catch. I know WMI logging is, is kind of in vogue now. We're going to talk about that next uh, as far as a big thing people are talking about. Sysmon added it recently about two weeks ago. But it's actually pretty easy to detect PowerShell launched by, in this case, uh, PS exec SVC. All right, that's a real easy signature to write. You probably don't normally launch PowerShell that way. Maybe you do, you know? But let's look at that. And WMIC is even scarier. So WMIC uh, is how a lot of, uh, uh, well, petty other things are. And once again, lost in the wilderness, I can thank Ed Scotus for this. I was running these commands, and I was seeing no output. I'm like, where is my output? Do what I mean, you know? And I wasn't seeing the output. I wasn't seeing the output. And then Ed had posted on a command line, uh, Kung Fu, him and Hal, um, him and Hal would go, go back and forth, Hal Pomeranz, you know, Ed would do it in PowerShell, Hal would do it in Unix, Linux, back and forth. And Ed had posted, hey, mount a share, there's a standard out, it's hitting the local system. It's not hitting you, it's hitting the local system. So dump it to a share and then grab it that way. Okay. Dump it to a share, grab it that way. And here you see, uh, Mimi Cats, uh, running. And again, pretty easy to detect. Um, uh, PowerShell launched by WMI, in this case. Uh, you're probably not launching PowerShell that way. You might be launching it via PS exec. You're probably not logging it that way. So you have at least two ways to catch this. Uh, the security event 4688 with uh, two GPO changes. Check last year's talk. Also on my, my website, by the way, Deep Blue CLI with the details on that. Or Sysmon event one. I mean, I would do Sysmon because Sysmon's so awesome. Or both. And Deep Blue CLI newly updated handles both of those use cases automatically. I'll go through quickly a few of the older examples here. I just want to show you some of the current... Um, wave of post-exploitation. Here we have PowerShell Empire and fileless malware, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what it looks like here. And notice that it automatically decodes it, right? This is Deep Blue CLI, uh, the new object output mode. Automatically decodes it, it, it recognizes that, and it runs its kind of, hero well, heuristics might be a strong word, I guess, its signatures against both. It runs its signatures against the command itself, and it tells you, hey, that's long, 500 plus uh, consecutive base 64 characters, it's a base64 uh, encoded and hidden PowerShell function. And then the, the last two actually aren't run on the first command. It dbase64s this command automatically, then scans what's below, and the last two hits are from the, the normalized stuff. And you see there, you know, how, ma how many normal programs, non-malicious, set their own user agent on the command line? Not a lot. Not a lot, right? So, um, of course, Metasploit's PS exec. Very typical behavior. Dump the hashes, get in, get system, dump the hashes. And it acts very, very reliably. Uh, and how it even creates the pipe, the length of the name of the pipe is always lowercase. It's always six characters. The service name is always 16. 
And someone mentioned kind of purpose solution fallacy. Eric, an attacker could change that. Oh yeah, you have the source code, you can change a lot of this stuff, but one of the things I've learned in my career, defaults are powerful, man. Defaults tend to stick. Even when you're talking nation states, defaults are powerful. And if we don't catch everything, hopefully we'll catch enough of it, mainly long commands, very commonly. And uh, here's PS exec uh, exploit target PowerShell. There's a big long command there. And here is deep blue CLI automatically parsing that and automatically uncovering or decoding the, uh, the, the, the compressed and the base 64 encoded content. Here's PS attack. PS attack is one of the ones that scared me the most. It left no footprints. On a normal Windows 7 box, which is kind of my test case as a typical client thing, it left no footprints whatsoever, right? And um, it, it actually doesn't use PowerShell. It's PowerShell without PowerShell, which is frightening as well. We see a lot of that now, that there's new waves of, of um, development now in this PowerShell without PowerShell stuff where they're triggering a PowerShell script without c calling PowerShell.exe. There's probably a dozen or more ways to do it. Here's one that they, um, they compile it basically on the fly. And now Deep Blue CLI looks for that, and it catches that as well. And uh, my big fright last year was I got the tool all done, feeling good about myself, and it's pretty much purely signature-based. And thankfully, 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 Daniel Bohannon was kind enough to show a screenshot of what he had coming, which would have totally bypassed Deep Blue CLI. So I would have given my talk, and then a day later he would have just refuted my talk, and I would have been, you know, sad, you know. And um, but he was <laughs> he was kind enough to post a screenshot. There was enough detail in the screenshot um, where I've watched this talk a number of times. It's just it's just Jedi Master. He perceives reality in a way that I don't, in a very awesome way. And I just it's it's so great that he's here working red and blue. I just I think it's I just love our industry and I love this conference. And he posted a screenshot. I'm like, oh damn, I'm screwed. It's over. <laughs> Change my flight, leave. And then I'm like, wait, wait, there's a there's a lot of pluses there. Uh, maybe I'll just like, I don't know count the pluses. And uh, <laughs> that was, so the night before, at like 12.30 a.m., I'm furiously pushing stuff to GitHub the night before last year to detect a lot of pluses. And it works. And now, of course, Daniel's done all kinds of other crazy obfuscations since, which I'll show you some of. I've also got some event logs now. If you want to download some of Daniel's handiwork, of course, please download Invoke Obfuscation. Check that out. But uh, if you want to just look at the EVTX files, I got a whole pile of malicious EVTX files. Whether you use Deep Blue CLI or not, check out these EVTX files, ingest them into whatever you use to ingest EVTX. And if it says not malicious, it's wrong, okay? So even if you don't use a talk, grab the EVTX files. We kind of like treating these EVTX files as, you know, PCAPs basically in a different form. Share them, ingest them, see what it says. Whatever you've got, Splunk or Arcsite or whatever, update that stuff if it's not catching it. So uh, thank you, Dan Daniel, for this. Now, as you all know, I know I'm stating the obvious, this is the same um, Mimikast command I showed you previously. I know what you're thinking, duh, Captain Obvious, but hey, not everyone's as cool as you, right? So this is the invoke Mimikast. This is literally, going back now, that command right there. That's that command, right? That command is that, obviously, right? And uh, <laughs> I do have to once in a while look back and it's like, wow. Sometimes I have those wow moments. I'm like, Wow, that runs Mimikatz, that downloads Mimikatz, that runs it. And um, ironically, light obfuscation is harder to detect than heavy. The heavier uh, it goes, the easier it is to detect. So I just start laying more and more rounds, because you can do multiple rounds. You can do binary encoding, and then this encoding, and that encoding, and space encoding, and splat encoding. You can go on and on and on. But every round of encoding makes it longer. Once you go past 1,000 bytes, which you can change that number, it's going to flag anyways, right? And as you add less and less normal alpha characters and more and more stuff like this, that is 3% normal stuff you see in a command line. It lights right up, right? So the more obfuscated it is, the, the easier it is to detect, at least the way I do it. A bit counterintuitive, but helpful. So light obfuscation is actually the best use case. I don't know why I'm aiding the enemy, just like I helped Trent. But anyways, apparently I do this. Um, <laughs> telling you how to defeat my tool. I don't know. I don't know. That's how I think. I'm red and blue as well. So here's invoke obfuscation. Now that I have the tool, of course, I wanted to use it because it's awesome. And you set a script lock. There's the same script lock we saw before. That's our use case. And um, you set the script lock, and we apply one round. We do a little light sprinkling now, a little light sprinkling of a uh, string concatenation, right? And there's the obfuscated command below. And interestingly enough, um, Deep Blue CLI caught it because it didn't catch any obfuscation. It missed that. But it caught, uh, there was enough patterns there, including PowerSploit, including Mimikatz, including Invoke Mimikatz, including NetWeb Client. All that was still there. 
Uh, so it missed the obfuscation, but it caught enough strings. So again, if you want to bypass this, basically break up those strings that would be in the regex, uh, but leave it short and not too obfuscated. That, that's a current dodge. I'm not saying I can't figure that problem out, but the, the version today, full disclosure, doesn't catch that. All this code is in GitHub, by the way. Everything you've seen, all these EBTX files, you can see these exact same screenshots yourself by downloading the code from GitHub. So now we did, we did two rounds. Um, one of the things about this tool, you can apply it multiple rounds. So we did two rounds, and as you, every round you add makes it longer and busts up more strings. Notice um, PowerSploit is now busted up, and Mimikatz is now busted up. But meanwhile, the, the alpha count, the normal alpha count, is much, much lower. And now we're only 44% alpha, alpha numeric in common, and that's below the threshold. The threshold I've currently set at 65%, but it's just a global variable. You can change that any way you want. Tune it to your taste, you know? So the more you obfuscate, the, um, the uh, harder, the easier it is to detect. And here's binary encoding. Again, once in a while, I'm like, I had no idea it was possible, but here you are. And um, it's encoding as binary. And I had to add this. This is one that slipped by. So I was running invoke um, obfuscation. And the simple alpha count was working. And, but the simple alpha count includes 0 and 1 as normal things you see in a command, right? And this slipped right past it, because that's mostly zeros and 1s. And those were declared normal, because they are normal, you know? And um, you see those. Just because you see a one, it's not a binary one necessarily. It normally isn't. So I had to add a second. There's really only two pieces that detect this currently, and it's still pretty effective. Percent normal alpha, percent zeros and ones. And that seems to catch most of it, right? And I like simple approaches. I want stuff you can do at work. You know, I love the theoretical stuff. I love the stunt hacking, too. I love all that stuff. Jackpot and ATM. I mean, who, make a plane fly, fly side, sideways. Sure. That's awesome. But what do I do at work on Monday? And I want it to be simple enough that I can, well, I can understand it, and it works. And so percent alpha and percent zeros and ones currently detects almost all this stuff. Cool. I like that it's simple. And here's deep blue CLI versus that. It says, hey, it's 79% zeros and ones. And that's, that's not normal. And the percent zeros and ones is also a global variable you can set yourself. So the other thing I did last year, uh, or I promised last year, and here we are, is object output. Because if you haven't used PowerShell objects, and I'm just, again, write a script with custom objects. It locked in my mind then. And, and deep blue CLI is a very simple object I created. Um, it just kind of, vapor, it just uh, radar locked in my mind. And because um, I wanted object output, because once you have object output, you have access to all kinds of output formats that are built in a PowerShell and are wonderful. Format table, format list, outgrid view, uh, convert to CSV, convert to HTML, convert to JSON, convert to XML. If you output objects, all that stuff becomes available. And so um, um, and about a week ago, <laughs> I converted to objects, which was, in my mind, it seemed like the right choice, and now I believe clearly it is. All the previous examples you saw were format list, which is the more verbose one, right? That's the default output. Format table is a little table, tabular style. You can also output HTML down there, and I'll demo this shortly, time willing. And uh, there's uh, HTML at the bottom. One of my favorite things is our grid view. So here's invoke obfuscation, um, a bunch of those events in our grid view. And all you got to do is just pipe it. Just run deep blue CLI against the EVTX, pipe out dash grid view, or OG as the shortcut goes, and boom. And what's beautiful about this, I know it's hard to see, there's this little add criteria button here where you can actually do a search. You can search for any string. If you can use a browser, you can use our grid view. So people say, oh, it's a PowerShell framework, that sounds hard. I've had 22-year-old kids in, in, in socks use this thing because our grid view is about as easy to use as a browser. So you don't need to know PowerShell to run PowerShell. And some of these output modes are just absolutely amazing. You know, head and shoulders beyond what anything on Linux currently does, that's for sure. You give credit where it's due. It's awesome, you know? All right, um, so that's Deep Blue CLI, bringing you up to speed on that. And again, I had this idea for years where um, automatic detective whitelisting, what we called a, a, a belt and suspenders process for automatic detective whitelisting, meaning grab all the hashes from your running processes and DLLs and, um, keep blanking on the last one, it'll come to me, um, and uh, sys files, sys files, uh, and drivers, sorry, drivers, for some reason I get stuck on drivers. So all, all uh, EXEs, all drivers, all images slash DLLs, Sysmon can, can log the, the hash of that. It turns out power, um, VirusTotal supports an automatic and free API for submitting hashes to VirusTotal. And with a free public uh, API, you, can, you have to register with them and get a key. It's free. You can submit uh, four per minute for free, one every 15 seconds. And so what Deep White does, it just loops through. If it's seen it before, it, you know, if it, it scans it once. If it's seen it once, it scans it once. Well, it checks the whitelist. If it's not on the whitelist, it sends the virus total. And once it's done that once, it won't do it again. So once you normalize it, it kind of gets quiet it's down. It only scans brand new hashes. And um, it simply just has a timer waiting once every 15 seconds. 
it works really, really well. 100% free, free as in beer. So it automatically check the SHA-526 uh, hash of every EXE, DLL driver in your entire organization for free, right? Requires Sysmon, but it's amazing stuff. And um, how do you generate a whitelist? Um, that command there is all you need, live off the land. Generate a whitelist right there. So take your clean system image, hopefully clean, run this command, get, get child item, blah, blah, blah. That's now your whitelist. So whatever you thing you use to, whatever, whether it's an ISO or you're ghosting that thing out, run that command on that thing. That's your whitelist. And then if it's not on that whitelist, it'll, it'll check it. You can also use that same command to create a list of CSVs to sub submit. So deep white takes not only stuff from the, the sysmon events, it also can feed in a CSV file. So you can use that, that get, um, child item to generate a whitelist or a list of stuff to check, right? So, hey, this system's acting weird. Run that command, free, PowerShell. Give me the CSV, deep white will submit all that stuff if it hasn't seen it before and it's not whitelisted. It's basically automating this process. And once again, if you script it, if you typed it twice, you should have scripted it once. I've manually submitted many, many things to VirusTotal. There's the hash from mimicats.exe. There's a SHA-256 hash right there in the um, Sysmon event one. And here's what VirusTotal thinks about that. Clearly bad, right? Clearly bad. And I've manually done that, but it was a piece of cake. Deep White took me a couple of hours just to complete. And I'm no PowerShell expert, believe me. I'm, I'm, I know more than I did a year ago, which isn't saying a whole lot. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, in Python, I could have done it twice as fast. A couple of hours it was done. It's a very simple idea. And if you infer from my comments, I like simple things that work, right? So can I automate this for free? And um, here's Mimi Katz. This would be a deep white now. Again, this code is also on the deep blue CLI GitHub site. And um, here it is here. It's like, hey, um, by the way, um, one thing I learned, if you get one or two hits, don't freak out. It's probably nothing. Don't have a heart attack. I took a Windows 10 ISO and submitted everything to virus total. I had over 10 hits, 10 individual hits on 10 individual files, like one hit on 10 different files. Microsoft signed binaries would sometimes get flagged by one vendor. So don't have a heart attack as I did initially, because I was, I was scanning the VM we hand out to Security 511 students, and it flagged like eight things in virus total. I'm like, my career is over. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta grab my passport and leave the country. <laughs> Learn a new language. And I, once I calm down, it's like, wait, one here, one there, what is that? So what is that? Really aggressive um, vendors who think PS exec um, is, is evil. Um, that's the signed PS exec I downloaded from Sys internals. Now, unless Mark Rasinovich has turned evil, I don't, I don't think so. Um, why does Sophos think that's bad? Because bad things are done to that process. Yeah, I get that, but it's the one from Mike. It's not evil. Don't shoot the messenger, right? So if you see a count of one or two, I even put a warning in there. If you see a count of one, I might have had it here. Yeah, don't panic yet. <laughs> I had to add that to calm myself down, perhaps you in the future down, right? And why else do we get false positives? Does Microsoft still send you software unsigned? Yeah, .NET fr uh, framework has a lot. Um, they're not perfect. They're 99% there, you know? And um, again, perfect is the enemy of good, right? So Microsoft does have unsigned stuff. And, and that window is closing, but famously .NET framework kind of stuff, it's not all signed. And some vendor cranks up the heuristic model on 11 and will flag a bunch of stuff, right? Um, I don't know what the hacker, the people the hacker are doing. They should move into real estate or Wall Street or something. I don't know what they're doing, but this isn't working. All right, so um, wait, there's more. So because I'm a glutton for punishment, um, and let's port all that to Python, <laughs> he said confidently six weeks ago. And <laughs> now fortunately, I'm a better Python coder than a PowerShell coder, and also a faster Python coder than a PowerShell coder. But there's, um, I just wanted this in Python, because I'm, I'm going to explain to you shortly, there's a revolution happening in Sims. Uh, Elastic Stack, formerly known as Elk, is just it's lighting the world on fire among the top 1% of leading edge companies who have figured out that Sims are a difficult business model that's very expensive and failure prone, right? And when you complain to your Sim vendor that, hey, my Sim is really slow and it's just buckling under the weight, your Sim vendor says, you, my friend, need to buy more Sim, right? And then, and then six months later, you're like, hey, Sim vendor, it's happening again. It's all slow, it's horrible. You know what? More Sim, more Sim. And you spend another half million dollars, hey, hey, sim vendor. And, and if you get stuck in that loop, convince Andy McDowell to fall in love with you, and then you'll break out of the loop, okay? So, uh, <laughs> sorry, Groundhog Day. All right, so, um, and, um, or check out Elk, right? And I, I, it's funny, I've been talking in LobbyCon here, and uh, people walk up to me like, well, Eric, you know, if I want to run Deep Blue CLI on my sim, what do I do? I'm like, well, peel out the event logs. Yeah, my sim doesn't do that. Um, well, write a PowerShell script. Yeah, my sim can't do that. 
well, how about you ingest them here? Yeah, my sim can't do that. I'm like, you just told me three things your sim can't do, and you spent $2 million on that thing. You know, it might be time for a moment of introspection here. You know, is this working? You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking all sim vendors, but if a lot of the things I'm describing, like you physically can't use get win event to look at event logs because you've been too abstracted away from them, never get too far away from the source data. I've just learned this. You know, IDSs that won't show me the PCAP, I want the PCAP. Do not ab abstract the PCAP away from me. Same thing here. Don't make the event logs disappear. You know, if you're not, if you're not scripting in a sock, you're making a mistake. Most, you know, I call people scripting in socks magic unicorns, right? If you're writing scripts in a sock, you're a magic unicorn and I love you. You're awesome. We need more of you, right? But the, the sims abstract too much of that away. And I've had five people tell me all the things their sim can't do. And, you know, there's a, there's a follow up question to that, right? So why Python? Because the ball's moving there. You know, when I was um, in college, I went to college in the UK for a year, and I played rugby there. And I uh, played rugby as an adult, and I had four surgeries to speak for that, separate from this one. And a guy named Cormac McCarthy was on my team in Cambridge, Mass, and he played on the, the Ireland under-18 side. Um, he was our best player, because none of us were that good. And he told me, Eric, I, I go where the ball is going to be. And I know many sports people have said that before, Gody Howe, et cetera, but he's the first person who said it to my face. I don't go where the ball is, I go where it's going to be. And I remember that quote. In technology, when where's the ball going to be? We know where it is now. And um, I think the, uh, the elastic stack revolution, basically Cliff Notes version is big data, open source big data. And uh, the ball is moving there. And um, a lot of um, commercial vendors are, are gutting their traditional relational database back end and moving to Elk with Elk's free. And like, well, what am I paying you for? Well, like, well, the dashboards. Well, guess what else has dashboards? Uh, Security Onion has dashboards, right? So um, this is Sysmon on Security Onion. Yeah, so Doug Burks, unfortunately, I was counter-programmed. Um, I was at Security Onion Con a year ago, and um, Security Onion Con was last week, and I wanted very much to be there to talk, because those are my people, the blue team, right? And um, and uh, Doug Burks, well, anyways, it ran against SANS Network Security. I couldn't be there. But they, they, they've now moved an alpha version Security Onion onto Elk, and... Um, it's amazing. So security onion is not just packets anymore, not just flow anymore. When is event log ingestion, right, on uh, Linux, right? Obvious question, how do we get the, uh, the, uh, the logs there? How do I get event logs on Linux? There's no free open source solution I know of that works. I think that'll happen soon. A lot of people are looking at this. I have no commercial connection to NX log. I just asked them some questions. I bugged them a bit. I said, I'm doing a talk. How much does it cost? How does it work? $189 for a Windows event log collector on Linux, right? And that's pretty amazing. And once you, and by the way, it's, it's not a binary choice. You can have all your Windows desktops and servers send to a central point, like a SIM, and have some of them also simultaneously send to a different uh, system. Just peel off the command lines from Sysmon Event Log or Security Event 4688, send everything to your SIM normally, and send those at least to this. It's a pretty flexible choice. The rest of it's free. That's the only money you'd have to spend beyond hardware. And um, uh, by, hopefully by next year's DerbyCon, I'll have this fully built out. Just a few words on a lot of interest on the Python side of this, and I kind of waded through the wilderness here a bit more comfortably because this is where I'm natively coming from. Uh, Python EBTX is the, the number one thing you see when you Google it, and I very excitedly saw that, and then it, it started blowing up on some event logs. Just a, it's a UTF encoding thing. I don't know what happened. I'm not throwing that stone. I think they're awesome. Running open source software, I've done a little bit of that. They've done more. I love it. I love it, I love it. But it doesn't work well enough for this anyways. I found libebtx, which works wonderfully well. Simple, top-down report. It doesn't give you full XML. It actually strips out a lot of detail, string one, string two. This thing had all the full XML tree. This thing stripped it up, but it turns out I don't need all those tags. You want to build out a GUI with all the leaves fully populated? Sure, you need the XML. But if I'm just going for the CLI and the service name and this and that, I don't need all that stuff. And this simplicity aided me greatly because I coded this like, like the wind man. I just flew. DeepBlue.py uh, took me about five hours. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a better PowerShell coder, uh, uh, Python coder, but the, the top-down format, when I first saw it, disappointed me because it was missing a lot of the, 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 the tags, the names, but the raw data is all there. And, and you give me standard in, line-by-line -line output, and apply regular expressions, I'm born for that, man. I, I'm, that's where I came from, right? Pro guy way back, and here is deepblue.py um, on Linux on Security Onion. So in my uh, less than 11 minutes left, let's do a demo. What could possibly go wrong? All right. Again, the talk's online. I know I covered a lot. So uh, here is um, Deep Blue against uh, PowerShell Invoke Obfuscation, PowerShell version. And uh, you see the reports here. This is just me doing lots of naughty things against that system. Even uh, This is my favorite. This is the, the space encoding. See that? 
Command, quote, space, 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 blah, blah, blah. I like that one the best, actually, because you just have this blank screen. You think something's wrong, right? You can also, of course, do, um, now, without its objects format table, you can do out grid view. Here it is here. And again, you can add criteria. You can search for stuff in here in the message, whatever you want. And it's got the whole command and everything else. Let's do a power exploit out grid view. OG, oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I'll just do out. OGV, thank you. OGV, so I told you my PowerShell is not all that yet. And it shows you everything included that a coded command. You can also do um, uh, convert to CSV, greater than example.csv. Now it's a CSV file, you can open up with Excel. You can do convert to HTML. Greater than example.html. This, this is all PowerShell objects. I, I, I can't take credit for this. This is the, 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 the amazing strength of PowerShell objects. And once you've done that, you can do this. Did I do that right? Oh, my, my, that should work. If not, I'll just move on. Thank you, though. Um, sort by name. Oh, I'm on my desktop. Thank you. Thank you. I was not following you. Thank you. On my desktop. That's the, uh, thanks for the lifeline, my friend. I appreciate it. Like, do what I mean, like I said. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for the lifeline. For some reason, um, um, IE doesn't work on this, but, um, Chrome does. Thank you. I would not have figured that out in real time. And, uh, so here it is in, I, I know my, uh, I can do uh, this. Here it is, too much, went too far. And um, that, that's the HTML view. Again, I can't take any credit for those output formats. That's just objects plus PowerShell's awesomeness. And while we're here, here is Deep Blue on, running on Security Onion. I've not integrated this into a dashboard yet. If I have any volunteers who are good with GUIs, please approach me at LobbyCon. I'm, I'm running low in time. The next person has to talk. What I'll do is I go out in the hallway, I'll drop my bag off. If you have questions, let's meet at LobbyCon. But here is Deep Blue on uh, Linux. So I get eight minutes to the hour, and I wanted to say um, thank you. And before I forget, sorry, one more thing, thank you.